All right. Hello and welcome to Noon Conferences hosted by MRI Online. In response to the changes happening around the world and the shutting down of in-person events, we've decided to provide free daily Noon Conferences to all radiologists worldwide. Today we are joined by Dr. Zavaro, Chandi, and Bulligan. We will begin with a presentation from Dr. Abaro, and following that presentation, we will be following up with a panel discussion. Dr. Abaro is a GI radiologist in the UK and current radiology research fellow at St. Mark's Hospital and Academic Institute, where she is undertaking collaborative PhD research in CT colonography performance with the University of College London. A reminder there, we will also be using the Q&A feature to ask all of the questions that we want the panel to discuss uh, in that later section. So please use that feature, and we will get to as many as we can before our time is up. That being said, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Barrow. I'm going to let you take it from here. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having me. Move this over here. Okay, um, I'm Anu and I'm hopefully gonna share with you um, the UK perspective on racism, um, its impact on the NHS, um, which is our National Health Service, my experience um, working as a black female doctor in the NHS, and hopefully finish up with an encouragement for my colleagues and friends and all of you to be proactively anti-racist. Um, at the end of this talk, I'll share a link um, where you can hear um, a slightly different presentation, the kind of longer version of this, which will describe a bit more of my personal experience and how I came to be in this position of wanting to speak out about racism in this context. Okay, so let's start with the colour of power in the UK. This is a visual depiction of Britain's most powerful leaders and it was research done by an independent consultancy called Greenleaf and um, Operation Black Vote, which is an organisation that promotes justice and racial equality in the UK. And they assess 39 categories across central government, local government, public bodies, private sector, education, and um, on screen you can see our political party leaders, some cabinet members and government ministers. And they basically found that 95% of those roles are filled by white people and only 4.7% of the most powerful roles in the UK are filled by non-white people. And that's compared to 13% of the population being composed of non-white ethnic groups. So what does this look like on a more personal level? Um, I'm sitting here speaking to you and I recognize that in this position or in my position in life, I am considered a privileged black person for sure. But despite where I am now and what I've been able to achieve, I've always been acutely aware of my skin color all the way from childhood, getting teased at school or bullied, um, to being told throughout my educational journey um, that either I was too ambitious to want to study medicine or that I wasn't intelligent enough to study medicine, um, into navigating an environment where I'm always fighting against labels. Um, and I think a lot of the black experience is um, kind of associated with questioning whether or not something that's happened to you is as a result of the color of your skin. As I've gotten older, um, got married and had children, the impact of race has kind of infiltrated every area um, of my life. And especially in the last few weeks or months since George Floyd's killing, um, it's been a massive topic of conversation in our, in our house. And one of the things that I think is really important to understand from a black person's perspective is that there's no getting away from conversations about race, whether or not you want to discuss them. So I have two sons, one is five and one is almost two. And just a couple of days ago, my five-year-old asked me if black people are more important than white people. And, um, and it was a really difficult moment because he's obviously picked up on the energy or the psyche of the moment. And, in wanting him to feel valued and recognized and um, important as a young black boy, I think we've almost had a pendulum swing of him now thinking that maybe there's certain groups of people that are more important than others. And really the message isn't that black people are more important than white people, or that white people are more important than black people, but that people are equal. And so these are conversations that we are already having with him to kind of redress the balance of making him feel valued despite the 
um, perceptions that are put on him by society. So when we consider the NHS, so that is in the UK, the National Health Service, and it's our tax funded healthcare, and it's provided to everyone, irrespective of their gender, their race, their age, and it's provided on the basis of need versus the ability to pay at the point of delivery. The NHS employs over 1.2 million staff, and it is the biggest employer of um, black and ethnic minority staff in the country. Now, NHS trusts um, are the organisations that manage hospitals and community services, and they commission services for their patients. There's 223 NHS trusts in the country, and they have budgets of millions of pounds. Um, they employ thousands of staff, and they deliver care to hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals. So, when we consider um, the top 50 NHS trusts in the country. And this is, um, again, research done by the Colour of Power organisation. And they assess the top 50 NHS trusts according to their busyness, if you like. So the top 50 um, trusts that had the most consultant episodes. And when you look at that group of people, out of the 50, only three of them are for, from an ethnic minority. And when you consider um, all of the NHS trusts across the country, 94% of them have um, white people as their chairs. So only 6% of chairs in the NHS are ethnic minorities um, and that is versus a workforce of almost 20% ethnic minority in the UK so there's a huge disparity there. Now if you consider not just the chairs so that would be like the most executive board but look at just the workforce so um, this is data from the workforce race equality standard and these are figures from um, 2019 and this is basically um, data that is collected from hospitals about the experience of their staff and part of that is their pay banding um, and their ethnicity and so you can see on the graph that we have represented um, bands one to nine band one being the lowest nine being the highest and VSM being very senior managers in London, which is what this graph is showing specifically, we have a much higher um, percentage of ethnic minority staff, 45% um, compared to um, about 19% in the rest of the country. So 45% of the clinical staff working in London are from an ethnic minority, and that's the green line on the graph. When you consider their pay, banding, and their ethnicity, you can see that we are overrepresented in the lower bands and underrepresented in the higher bands. And the converse is what is um, true for our white colleagues. So they are lesser in the lower bands and they're massively overrepresented in um, the higher positions. And so obviously this leads to an inherent pay gap because of the um, lack of ethnic minorities in those higher banded um, job posts and so this is for the clinical workforce which is like our nurses and our radiographers and when we consider our medical staff so this is data from the NHS um, pay study this is 2018 data updated last year and this shows us that for the when you consider the mean monthly basic pay of doctors for every one pound that a black female doctor is paid a white male doctor is paid one pound 38 and amongst all the ethnic groups that are evaluated in this particular data set, black women are paid the lowest. Um, um, and when you consider black male doctors as a reference standard point, for every one pound they're paid, um, white consultants are paid one pound 15. And again, compared to um, black female doctors, um, they're paid more. So this pattern of inequality is, is replicated throughout the kind of medical career trajectory here. So from medical school into junior training, um, into your um, more senior posts, there's differential attainment 
amongst ethnic minorities. We don't do as well as white doctors and academic tests. We don't, we're not getting into the top jobs. We're much more likely to be referred to the General Medical Council, which is our regulatory body. And if we are referred, we're more likely to have our cases investigated and we're likely to face harsher sanctions for seemingly similar um, infractions to our white counterparts. Still, white applicants are 1.4 times more likely to be appointed to roles from shortlisting than candidates from an ethnic minority. And importantly, 15% of black and minority ethnic staff report experiencing discrimination or bullying in the last one year compared to 6.6% of white staff. So, those are kind of like the broad overarching problems and it's really easy when you're looking at figures and things like that to forget about the individuals that make up all of those experiences and make up all of those numbers so for me th these are just a few of the things that i've experienced during the course of my career and training working in different hospitals around the southeast of england and on some occasions there's been open hostility from patients um, related to my race and to a lesser degree from um, my colleagues that has happened far more um, infrequently but what is frequent and probably no less harmful is the more subtle discrimination um, being overlooked for um, career progression opportunities having to tolerate negative racial humor feeling socially excluded um, not listened to and i think everybody can agree that being a doctor is difficult um, and as a black female doctor, some of those experiences are compounded. So whatever is your, are your baseline insecurities, they're amplified now by being black and female in the medical workplace. So all of those things contribute to feeling undervalued, um, isolated, misunderstood, ignored. And if you are kind of bold enough to raise any issues or tackle um, some discrimination that you've experienced in the workplace, invariably you're met with downplaying of the racialized aspect of the incidents or an outright right denial or a, well, he's normally a really nice person or you must have caught him on a bad day and really excusing the um, perpetrator rather than holding them accountable for whatever it is that had just said, what um, has just happened. It's also, I think really important to recognize that the what the barriers are so the barriers for me for example are not that I'm black and that I'm female and if you place the emphasis there then actually um, it makes me it makes the onus of responsibility for changing the system mine and actually that's not the barrier the barrier is the white dominant social construct that we are existing within and the barrier is not me being female but the patriarchy and the kind of holding out of white male white men as the kind of reference standard for normal for everything else and um really what what i guess black people and ethnic minorities are really asking for is that our contributions to our profession should be recognized and that we are given access to real opportunities and access to senior roles so that was looking at the workforce. So when we consider that we're here to serve our patients, we recognize now that inequality doesn't just affect um, our staff, it affects our patients as it also does in the US. And something that I've heard several times is that if the NHS is so-called free, um, how can it be structurally racist? Um, and I would say that there's inherent inequality in our society and the NHS is essentially the sum of its parts. It's the sum of people and attitudes in society. So the natural extrapolation of that is that the inequality that we see in everyday life is invariably going to be replicated in healthcare. So despite being free at the point of delivery, we know in recent data from earlier this year that black women have a five times higher risk of dying in pregnancy than white women in this country. And this is just one example of worse um, health outcomes in ethnic groups. And this is not because um, black women have five times higher rates of heart disease, which is associated with increased maternal death. So there are other factors at play that have to be considered. 
Okay, and when you combine racial inequality in the workforce and um, racial inequality in patient health outcomes um, in COVID, we see that the impact of coronavirus has been disproportionate amongst um, communities of colour. And in the UK, in the first um, couple of months of coronavirus, of this pandemic, 95% of the doctors that died were um, BMA, oh, BAME. So here we say BAME, which stands for Black and Ethnic, Black and Asian Minority Ethnic Groups. And so basically everyone that isn't white. And so um, we know amongst doctors, we make up 45%, ethnic doctors make up 45% of the workforce but we represented 95% of deaths. And is that because um, we were disproportionately in patient facing roles, probably, um, had poorer access to PPE, probably, um, had less, um, felt less confident or were more reluctant to raise concerns about the roles that we were being deployed to, probably. Um, and all of these things kind of created the perfect storm um, to amplify the inequality that already exists. And this is, as I understand, something that is also happening um, and has been happening in the States, that these are issues that have been in existence for so long and coronavirus has basically just amplified all of that. Um, so some of the men here are, are, were former colleagues and um, may their souls rest in peace. So the term Black Lives Matter is not um, a threat to other races. It's a cry for help. It's, um, it's a cry for people to recognize that racism gives society license to treat people differently and it, and it allows them to do that even if they die as a result because their lives don't matter and in the recent weeks and months we've been confronted by the racism and the ugliness of the racism that affects every area of our lives. So if we want to just talk about racism in general, um, I think it's really interesting that most people, well, nobody really wants to admit to being racist, very few people, but the impact of racism is everywhere and nobody admits to marginalizing people, but there is evidence of whole cohorts of people being marginalized. And I think when you recognize that, um, racism is a cultural disease it doesn't care if you're a white person that likes black people it's a system that we are born into and that we have to fight to get out of so racism is about power and privilege um, i think if you have um, for example insults um, that aren't backed up by power or privilege then they're nothing more than just insults and people can deal with them. But when you have racial insults that are backed by a power structure, suddenly they become um, weapons that can derail people's lives. They can become life altering. So I think we need to consider racism as a spectrum that involves people and organizations. And so we're gonna need both people and organizations with structures to deal with the discrimination. Racism doesn't just persist because of a handful of white supremacists. Um, even if you consciously reject racism, um, your innate biases and behaviors can still contribute and sustain um, discrimination. So I'm going to talk through just a couple of definitions because I think the language of this moment is really helpful um, um, to educate ourselves on. So we're going to do just a quick little social experiment. There's 18 pictures on your screen. And um, if you had to pick a single picture to answer the following questions, who would you pick? You don't have to write it in the chat or anything. Just think in your head. Um, so, for example, who would you cross the road to avoid? Who would you be relieved to see as your bank manager um, that you needed to approve a loan? Who would you assume has three children? Who are you most likely to trust? Who do you think is a teacher? Okay, so let's do some more. Who would you assume is telling the truth? Who would you be most comfortable approaching for directions? 
Who do you think is a doctor? Who do you think is a cleaner? So these are a series of, of photographs by a photographer called Bayet Ross Smith. And he's actually the gentleman in the bottom row of your, of your screens. And this is a photography exhibition called Our Kind of People. And he basically wanted to examine how clothing, skin tone and gender affect our ideas about identity and value and character. And without giving you any context, um, to assess the personality of the individuals, you project your own cultural bias onto each image. So that brings us to consider implicit bias. So although consciously we may reject negative ideas associated with minority groups, and we might even belong to those minority groups ourselves, we've all been immersed in a culture where these groups are constantly depicted in stereotyped prejudiced ways. So we have to consider that that influence from society and from culture can impact how we treat our patients. And basically every patient characteristic could cause bias. So their race or ethnicity, immigration status, how health literate they are, um, mental illness, their weight, their socioeconomic status, all of these things could cause bias in our minds, which potentially could then affect how we treat them, what treatment options we um, offer them, how um, willing we are to believe that they're genuinely in pain versus drug seeking. And this leads on to another difficult question, which is, does the cognitive awareness of your bias actually reduce its manifestation. So is um, anti-bias training as part of your diversity policy um, enough? Um, or as um, more and more data and research is showing that it's not just enough to have individual anti-bias anti -bias policy, but you need to actually have specific anti-bias processes that are um, allow you to have multiple checks and balances and multiple points of accountability, not just for the individuals, but also for the organization and for the organizational processes. So let's go on to talk about microaggressions. Um, Compared to history and certainly centuries or decades ago, overt displays of racism, of racism are rarer. They still occur, obviously, um, but they're to a degree lesser than um, in times gone by. What we are seeing now is more and more um, recognition of microaggressions. And, you know, initially when I would talk about these or discuss these with people, well, who aren't black, it always feels like you're kind of playing the race card or making a big deal out of something small. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important to consider when you're talking about microaggressions is the cumulative effect. So non-white people are invariably going to experience these regularly, sometimes multiple times a day. And so it's been likened to death by a thousand paper cuts. The psychological impact of all of these things happening in your workspace, when you go to the supermarket, when, you, when you're just kind of trying to carry on your regular life cannot be overestimated. And although nobody, not everybody agrees about the significance of microaggressions, there is quantitative evidence that ethnic minorities experience these um, at a disproportionate um, degree and that this subtle prejudice does impact psychological well-being and even if you control for difference in behavior and qualification ethnic minorities are less likely to be offered jobs we're more likely to be treated with suspicion in shopping areas um, we're more likely to be interpreted as more threatening um, you have a son who's five but is really tall for his age you know we, we have this thing of kind of over amplification of age, being seen as more adult, um, black women are more sexualized, all of these things contribute to the inequality that we experience. And lastly, I wanted to touch on um, white privilege. And this is the metaphor of the invisible knapsack, which was um, 
described by Peggy McIntosh, who's a white activist, an elderly lady now in the US, and she has described this invisible bag of special provisions that um, white people have. And I know white privilege can be a contentious topic, but I would say that it is really difficult to realize how important race is to your self-definition when you never have to think about it. When um, you're treated as the default norm and everything around you reinforces your self-worth versus somebody who isn't white. And white privilege isn't about money and it's not about class. Um, for me, it's really summed up in the absence of suspicion. And when I was putting together this slide, I was like, there's too many examples, I should take some off. But then, so all of these, I've experienced the opposite of. And so it is just testament to the fact that you can, someone, a white person can recognize, actually, there's a privilege that comes of the color of my skin. There's an absence of having to worry about certain things. There's an absence of suspicion when I have an interaction with authority that a black person doesn't have. And um, furthermore, um, if you are not black, for example, you can decide to disen disengage from conversations about race. You can decide that, you know what, this isn't something that I want to engage with and there would be no impact. Black people don't have the privilege of disengaging from this conversation because it's something that is embedded in our experience of life every day. Okay, so I wanted to end with kind of some suggestions on how we can become anti-racist so that it's not a completely depressing talk. <laughs> so, um, on the assumption that everybody wants to recognize racism in our society, recognizes that it exists and wants to challenge that. We have um, this diagram, the green path um, is basically racism, structural racism in society. And so that's the green road. So the top guy, the top stick man is your active racist. He is actively perpetuating discrimination against other races. Um, deliberate acts, insults, the hate crime are the white supremacist. So he's actively moving towards racism. So the second um, path is our non-racist. So this person, um, oh, let's go back, passively rejects um, racism. So they don't, um, they consider racism as extreme, um, overt, highly visible um, behaviors of a small minority of people. And, but non-racism unintentionally allows permission for racist actions to continue occurring because they're not challenging them. They're not putting a stop and standing against them. So they're still moving along the green path, even though they're not actively walking. And so on the bottom, we have the anti-racist. So this is the person who is actively turned around and they're walking in the opposite direction to the path. They're working against the institutional nature of racial inequality. They're challenging those systems and they're recognizing that they need to be proactive to see change happen. So what can you do as an individual? If you recognize, okay, now I, I want to be anti-racist, what can I do? So these are the seven A's of allyship. And this was, um, these, are, this is, these are a concept by Yvonne Coghill, who is the current director of the Workforce Race Equality Standard um, that I mentioned some of the data from at the beginning of the talk. And um, she's basically compiled these seven A's, which I present to you here. And I guess fundamentally, what she's saying is that being an ally or recognizing that you want to be anti-racist is one a conscious decision and you need to decide that you have the appetite to get involved in this so it's a lifelong commitment a lifelong effort that it's going to affect all different areas of your life um, you need to be curious about race your own as well as the experiences of other people that are not um, from the same race as you you have to accept there's a problem um, one of the responses that I've seen amongst many of our organizations is the, the need for more data and to be honest there's there's pretty there's a lot of data already this isn't the time necessarily for more data um, we need to be accepting that there's a problem that we can do something about we need to acknowledge externally um, that we recognize that there's a problem and this is where we stand on it we are not going to tolerate racial inequality don't make assumptions not 
um, every black person or Asian person has had the same experience, it's important to enter into dialogue and to ask people directly. And then you want to take demonstrable steps and you want to be accountable. You want to know that these steps that you're making um, are tangible changes that are gonna get you towards the goal of being anti-racist and challenging the structures that you exist in. So um, I think that everybody is at the center of their own sphere of influence. And this is a diagram that I've ad adapted from an artist called Danielle Cope. And this is basically to encourage us that there are so many different aspects of our lives that we can affect to tackle racism. And it's not just about making life better for black or brown people but actually what we're trying to do is improve society as a whole so you can't just go to work and sign off on your diversity policy but then tolerate racism um, in other um, areas of your life um, because then that all that means is that your anti-racist or your um, diversity policy at work is going to be ineffective because you've not really made the change um, or accepted that this needs to be a change affecting multiple areas of your life so we need to consider how can we promote diversity in our leadership in healthcare? How can we see the diversity in our junior trainees replicated in our leadership? How can we promote more um, research into underrepresented patient groups? How can we promote research by ethnic minority staff? Um, how can we attract funding so that we can plug data gaps um, amongst ethnic minority populations? How can we improve health outcomes for our patients and promote access to healthcare for those marginalized groups? Okay, so lastly, um, I wanted to just leave you with some suggestions for healthcare um, organizations. So there's a gentleman called Roger Klein, who is an absolute legend, look him up on Twitter. And he's an author and advocate and consultant um, on workforce culture. And he wrote a document in 2014 called The Snowy White Peaks of the NHS and basically highlighted the scale of discrimination within the NHS. And he was also, um, one of the pioneers of the workforce race equality standard, which I've mentioned before. So he um, has written um, several articles on suggest making suggestions of what organizations can do. And all of these pertain to radiology or can pertain to radiology. So equality, diversity, inclusion has to be part of core business, has to be part of our strategic planning and has to have allocated resource. Our leaders and our board members need to be able to explain why tackling discrimination um, by race is important for the NHS and our patient outcomes. And they need to be able to show what they're doing personally to address these. Um, one thing that we don't have well replicated here that I think you do have more of in the US is um, diversity officers, dedicated diversity committees. Some, so many of our organizations have these roles kind of added on to other corporate responsibilities, which just means that this issue gets less attention. So, um, Organization, le organization leaders need to understand the local challenges of their workforce and of their patients. There needs to be transparency of the equality data. A lot of the data is poorly captured. It's not transparent. It's impossible to find. Nobody wants to spotlight that they're not diverse and that they're not representing the population. So there needs to be a push to, that is the data that would be worth collecting um, in detail. Um, boards need to be proactive and preventative. Um, they have to use real research, the current data, the lived experience of their workforce to drive evidence-based interventions. There needs to be accountability at multiple stages with time-limited goals. And it needs to be no more homogenous decision-making by all white boards or all male boards, for example. And one of the things that Roger Klein highlights, which I think is really important, is de-biasing the processes. So you're not just targeting bias in individuals, but you're actually being proactive about developing um, processes that have anti-bias kind of built into them. So better transparency on how we appoint people, um, consequences for not meeting targets, incentives to meet um, diversity goals, etc. And then lastly, I think one of the really important things is prioritizing the psychological safety. Um, we 
many of us will know what it's like to be the only black person in a room or the only black person in a particular group and feeling like the token person, the token black voice, and then feeling like your voice isn't even heard and that it doesn't really matter that you're just there to kind of keep up appearances. And in that sort of environment, it's very difficult to speak up. And so really what you want is leadership that welcomes different perspectives that promotes inclusion and value and that creates a safe workplace for, for their staff and invariably then we're going to be able to support one another better listen to each other better there'll be less errors there'll be less bullying um, and less absenteeism and that behavior has to be modeled from the top down so i'll just leave you with this quote um, i think that Doing nothing um, has never been okay and is even less okay in this moment. And we have a responsibility to amplify voices, to try and create opportunities and networks and to try and improve things so that hopefully within our lifetime and the lifetimes of our children, we'll be able to say that definitive progress has been made. Um, so uh, lastly, there's, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I gave a, a kind of bigger version of this talk and explain how I came to kind of wanting to share my story a bit. So if you're interested, you can find it at um, the time URL racism ground round or you can scan the QR code. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Barr. I really appreciate that. Next, we will move into the panel discussion. So I will ask our other two panels to turn their video cameras on. Um, and while they're doing that, I just want to introduce them. Dr. Chandi is the son of an Ethiopian immigrant from a rural village and an Italian American mother who was the first woman at her, in her chemistry PhD program. He was born and raised in Michigan and received a PhD in medical physics from Harvard and MIT, and then went to Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bulligan uh, specializes in the treatment of breast and gynecology malignancies. She is a graduate of Harvard University and Yale University School of Medicine. She completed her residency at New York University, and she studies local and global cancer disparities. Perfect. Hello. I will let you guys take it from here. I do see some questions in the Q&A feature if you would like to discuss some of those. And other than that, I will leave this time up to you. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for having us MRI online. Uh, so let's start with some questions because there's some good ones here. The first question is, what do you think about white privilege? Would it be better to describe it as non-white disadvantage or are they the same? So I think that's a good question and it's, Im it's important to acknowledge both sides of the coin. So you can't just focus on the fact that there are disadvantages to uh, persons of color. For instance, they talk often about how if you change someone's name, right, whether it's an application for a home loan or if it's a student um, who's looking for mentors for research, the person of color, someone whose name doesn't sound traditionally American um, or, you know, European is going to have a harder time getting mentors and that can impact things down the line. So you have to acknowledge that there's a dis disadvantage to that, but also the flip side is that if you do fall into the categories uh, where you know, you're more mainstream, you sound traditionally American, you're going to have that privilege. And yes, we've you know, caught on to this, uh, this uh, term of white privilege, but that's because the privilege creates an inherent disadvantage to others. So they're both important to acknowledge um, in my, opinion but one has caught on more than the other yeah i think i would agree i think well white privilege for a start is a bit more catchy mm -hmm. i mean <laughs> just for yes. yeah we're going to talk about branding or whatever but i think also the I think we have to be careful about where we're placing the focus of responsibility for the change, right? So if the responsibility to make changes on people of color, for example, then the terminology should reflect that. But we know that we have been, as black people, unsuccessful in reversing racism because we can't, we're not, we don't hold the power. So I think the term white privilege speaks to the people that are in a position of power and and I think it, it kind of shines a light on what I believe are some of their responsibilities to one, recognize 
just their the kind of cultural currency that they have right and so the the and it doesn't it's it might not be fair but that is the reality it's no it's no less fair than what's happening to us right so yeah. i think the, so the term i think forces that kind of reflection and so and and unfortunately getting people to try and understand our experience hasn't worked to change our experience so there has to be a different kind of tact if you like i mean that white privilege as a term is not new it's been described since the 80s right mm -hmm. but it's just a recognition that there's a difference in the in the societal experience and and i think I think you have to put that into the context of the white power structure, if you like, which is why I think white privilege speaks to that specifically versus focusing on the disadvantage that it then creates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I have two things to say to this. And so we start off with just educating in general. There's this idea called white fragility. Yeah. And uh, right, white fragility is the feeling of discomfort when a white person is confronted about their whiteness. And of course, you could also talk about any group being experiencing discomfort when they are kind of faced with this issue. You could say, you know, heteronormative fragility, or you could say all sorts of <laughs> fragilities. But white fragility has kind of come up in this discussion of white privilege because to say that it is non white disadvantage is itself saying white is normal. Yeah. Because when you say white privilege, you're saying, okay, well, I feel normal, but I am elevated to certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And we talk about, like, as radiologists, many of us, not me, sadly yet, are wealthy, right? <laughs> and when someone says, oh, well, you make a lot of money or you have a lot of money, your first thought is like, do I though? <laughs> and so these are the kind of things where you always want to normalize yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you have to face that you may have some advantages, it can be challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that's a little teaching. And so then that was, that was a good question. I, I'm going to pick out the hard ones first, but hopefully we hit all of them. I really like this one down here. Uh, to, be truly anti to be a truly anti-racist institution, is it necessary to have affirmative action open parentheses, positive discrimination, close parentheses. Yeah, that's, the, yeah, that's a, I'm not sure that I have a great answer for that, but I will say that I highly doubt that we would have seen um, integration of schools or the rates of persons of color that we have in institutions of higher learning um, if we had not enacted things like um, affirmative action. So I know it's a touchy subject, it causes a lot of issues, but um, I think the, if the question is, you know, is affirmative action needed? I absolutely think it was, you know, needed. Um, maybe not all institutions at present have to have it, but I would say given the gestalt, the dynamic of what's happening right now, look at us, we're in 2020 and we're having an uprising about race. So we haven't, I would say we haven't yet come to the point where we can do away with things like affirmative action um, and making sure that our uh, institutions reflect the diversity of the world that we live in. So. I'll jump in really quick on this because it's very interesting. So yeah. affirmative action um, for the audience out there here in America, because I'm a global audience, we had this thing like 1970s, we started affirmative action. I don't know, Google, right? Um, so affirmative action was started. And if you look who the largest beneficiaries. beneficiaries of affirmative mm -hmm. action are Oyoni, you know you know you know do you know the answer I'm, I'm guessing it's not who we think it is it so. is not who you think it is <laughs> white women yeah when affirmative action was when has always been about underrepresented groups which includes minorities and white women now you might wonder what about the disabled 
uh, or what about vets? They're covered under separate laws, especially for them. So this has always been about, you know, sex-based discrimination and race-based discrimination. Over time, what you've actually seen happen is, you know, white women make great strides. And then as we kind of politicized it, the white women who f were a kind of, you know, gaining all this momentum. And then once they had gotten there, then it starts to turn off. Then people's perceptions of like, is affirmative action a good thing start to shoot in the other direction. It's like, well, maybe we don't because we picked mm -hmm. ourselves up by our bootstraps. So everyone else should. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like, is affirmative action like a thing that we should engage in? MIT um, in the past had terrible representation of women. When women would come and visit MIT, they'd say, I don't want to go to MIT because there's no other women there. So what MIT did was they added 200 points to every woman's SAT score. And they held it that way for, I think, like three years. What ended up happening was they oversubscribed women in their first few years, knowing that many would not come but then some did come. And then at that point, they were able to stop this affirmative action because there was, a, uh, there was enough women there to continue this momentum. So now when these women who were applying and they come and they see it, they say, oh, there's already other women here. I can see myself here. So that's always been the intention of affirmative action. You have this affirmative kind of push for some period of time. And once it's succeeded, you turn it off and stop it. The problem with affirmative action in America is we were never able to actually turn it on. And so it's always been this kind of thing from day one where they're trying to chop it back with ever, out ever really establishing it. Uh, and this is just like the American focus, but Anu, yeah. let's hear the, the, the- Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I find this an interesting concept because I feel like if you don't, people don't love targets, but they respond to them, right? You mm -hmm. respond to having goals as an organization. Yes. If there's a penalty yes. for you having all white leadership for five years in a row, then you probably will stop doing that, right? And so is that positive discrimination? I feel like whatever you want to call it, if it redresses the balance, then that is the goal, right? And I think the, the word discrimination is like so, well, it's a negative word, right? So it has, connotations attached to it but really are you positively discriminating if you're equaling the playing field like is it you're not disadvantaging the people that got all of the advantage before you're giving advantage to people that never had it mm -hmm. do you know what i mean and i think you're not and speaking specifically you know for our profession the um I always say it's not like we are asking for more than we are capable of or more than we are we have earned we just want the same opportunity right we want the same access to the leadership roles to be policy makers and policy changes and you know we're not coming with mediocrity invariably we're coming with excellence and so it's like are you positively discriminating because you give me a chance at interview and I still may not get the job. Like, so I'm like, I don't know. I feel like you have to, I think we're going, we're leaning towards now organizations recognizing that they have to have quotas and they have to be shown to be doing more than just getting the one person on the board, which means they can now say there's diversity amongst this organ. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. to add on to that, you know, I, I love what you just said and, and, a further issue is is it's so embedded in our culture or or our um, society right now that recently there was a publication from a respected NYU professor, right, Lawrence Mead. I don't even want to give it air, but this is a man who has built this grand reputation. Um, also, I think a former dean of uh, of um, University of Pennsylvania Medical School, they have been able to put out papers and, and commentaries. Basically, Mead said that minorities and persons of color shy away when they're given opportunities to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, oh that they were allergic to hard work. So when you have people who sit at the highest echelons of these institutions, still in 2020, 
putting out these sorts of opinions freely and thinking it's okay, it's not yet time for us to shy away from these, you know, these metrics, these uh, policies, because we are not there yet. We're not there yet. And I think, um, sorry, just to add to that, and I think part of that for me is where we really have to draw a distinction between what is diversity and what is inclusion, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I've had so many conversations in the last few weeks where I've been very frank about, I wouldn't be interested in applying for a role in this organization or to be part of this group because it's all white. I'm not interested in coming on because I know that I won't be included. I will be the first and the last, right? You want me because now it's, it, it looks good to, to add that diversity, but there's no inclusion. So when people say like, oh, oh, black people shy away from opportunity, we won't necessarily want to willingly walk into a toxic environment. That's what that is, right? So actually, if, like you're saying with the MIT example, if I go to a university or to somewhere that I know I'm qualified to get into, but there are no ethnic people, mate, that is the measure that I am using to mm -hmm. know what my experience is going to be mm -hmm. like, to benchmark it. So I'm like, I don't want to go there so maybe I'll go somewhere else that maybe academically or whatever isn't on the same scale but I know I'm probably going to last there more than I would last in this other environment where there's no one like me where I can't see anyone above me to aspire to where I can't see anybody else that's made it like mm -hmm. okay are we always going to be the, the people that are spearheading are we always going to be the ones that are the change make the, the one and I think it, there's a question here about not seeing many black radiologists at, at radiology meetings yeah. and yes I agree, because until I gave this talk, I didn't know all of these great <laughs> global black radiology superstars. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so talking about racism has ironically connected me to mentors and change makers that I would have had no access to and was kind of traveling this journey alone with great supervisors. I work with great people, but I'm the only black one. <laughs> so let's and knock out these racism. two questions real quick. There's one. Yeah. It's more of a comment from uh, 365 Diversity LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like they're an organization that work on dismantling yeah. uh, racism. You can find them at 365diversity.com. So we can mm -hmm. say that's done. Thank you for doing your work so much. Mm -hmm. And then here is a question which is, you know, should we expand this conversation to include sexual orientation, religion, LBGTQ? I say 100%. I'm something called a um, intersectional diversity person. So I believe you can't talk about uh, diversity along a single axis, which would be race yeah. or sex. You have to do multiple at once. That's how you diversify your groups. Yeah. So you can look up intersectional diversity. Kimberly Crenshaw established, uh, brought it up, I think, in 79 or 89 or something. Yeah. And so then let's devote the last five minutes to talk about this group of questions here. What can we do? Uh -huh. So as Anu was saying, um, we don't see black people at, at meetings. Uh, what can societies do? Uh, how do we teach it to our residents? How can you talk about racism without fear of retaliation? To answer yeah. that question, you can't. Unfortunately, sometimes you're going to get kicked in the gut for doing the right thing, yeah. but that's the black tax. That's the good trouble you're supposed yeah. to get yeah. into, yeah. right? <laughs> doing the right thing sometimes. I, I We had a so what are the things that you can do? Um, so we had a, a group of residents when all this came to a head. In radiation oncology, we had a group of residents that said, uh, we need to do more. And they formed a new subcommittee, the first in, the, in a decade that's been organized called the Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee. And they're going to do a, you know, first step is to assess the climate. They're going to do a survey of what are the thoughts of program directors, the people who are the gatekeepers, right, for our, our specialty. They're going to do a survey. They're going to create safe spaces to discuss these issues because apparently there are, you know, in the 20s, the number of black residents in radiation oncology is in the 20s and it's been declining. And so 
I never knew it was that stark. The number of faculty, I realized that my colleague and I who are at the same institution, he calculated that we represent 7.5% of the black radiation oncologists at one institution. So it's just really eye-opening. So one thing you can do is find out what's your organization doing? Does there need to be a new committee? And not just to form a committee, but what, what are your targets, right? And you talked about targets. You can't just say, we're forming this committee, let's just form it what are you going to look at? Are you going to look at what's the pipeline? It's not just a leaky pipeline. People just don't just drop out. Who is encouraging the individuals to enter radiology or radiation oncology or not encouraging them? Um, and then find out what are the issues that people, other trainees are dealing with and how can you tackle them together? The other thing I'll say is that it's really an international reckoning. I remember seeing the images from Belgium from you know Sweden of people toppling statues and I was so touched but a new year lecture has shown me that we we had to have an international reckoning the fact that black maternal mortality rate is high you know in NHS it's high in the USA two to three times more likely to die five times in the UK there is structural racism you know in there it's not just oh black women are more likely to die there is structural racism at play and we had to have we have to have an international reckoning. So I'll say on the individual level, you have to ask yourself, what am I doing, right? We know that black women are less likely to get their mammogram results, abnormal mammogram results as quickly as white women. Um, there was a paper from Columbia University that showed that, you know, the lag time from abnormal mammogram to actual, you know, conveying of those results could be almost double for women of color. So ask yourself, look at your own institution in your own sphere of influence, as you said, and, and find out, are you on an individual level taking the steps? Are you treating your patients the same? Do you report um, the mammogram results to the patient who's educated from you know, the Upper East Side, the more affluent part of New York, as quickly as you do to the patient who you know, just says, okay, whatever you say, doctor, and just assumes that everything is fine because you didn't contact them. So on an individual level and also on a processes level, look at your department. What are their policies that um, are in place to prevent women from getting later, you know, results than others? Um, and I'm sure there are other things that you can do as well, but those are some of the practical things that I would recommend. To tie this to the last question, I would recommend anyone out there, if you're in an institution that doesn't have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, to form one yeah. and make sure that it is intersectional in its membership. Yes. Uh, that should include everyone. You should have you know, your doctors, your nurses, your technologists, your staff, your porters, you know, the desk workers. It should include men, women, non-binary individuals, white, black, brown, Asian, and what you can do is when you build that coalition, then it is very hard for anything you say when you speak up yeah. to come back at you as a problem because you've built this shield of allies. Yeah. And, you know, when as black people, as we are so, so underrepresented in radiology, um, all you can ask for is allies right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I think we'll just wrap up by saying, I, okay. no, go ahead. and um, that I think in the spirit of um, our dear colleague, Geraldine McGinty, I think that for our radiology societies and um, organizations, we have to put pressure on them to develop a strategy that incorporates diversity and inclusion with timeline checkpoints it has to become part of core business and it cannot be an afterthought. We have to maintain that pressure, whether it's through setting up a specific committee, committee to leverage that pressure, then kind of by any means necessary at this point, there needs to be greater accountability. And there needs, this is our moment to kind of embed this into the working practice. And so, yeah, good trouble. We have to, we have to be ready to get into it. Perfect. Right. So I do know that we're at the hour and I appreciate your time and being here. So I want to make sure I give that time back to you. So as we bring this to a close, I really want to thank all three of you for your time today and sharing your knowledge and shedding light on such an important issue. 
as well as giving some suggestions on how we can continue to make change. And thanks to all of you for participating in this noon conference. A reminder that it will be made available on demand at mrionline.com in case you would like to watch it or share it with anyone. Um, and tomorrow we'll be joined by Dr. Ben White for a noon conference on student loans on, for the resident and educator. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.